Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Slavery in the Atlantic World, an online professional development seminar from America in class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. If my voice holds out, I'm afraid I'm, I'm operating with a bad cold, so please bear with me this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the National Humanities Center. I know some of our uh, long-term veterans, long-time veterans to our seminars know this gig, but uh, we have some new people with us this evening, so let me introduce the center. We are located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We're the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. That simply means we're an independent organization, a private nonprofit. We're an institute for advanced study, which means that we run a fellowship program here that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center for an academic year to research and write on topics in history, literature and language, philosophy, criticism, the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978, and since then about 1,300 scholars have worked here, and they have produced about 1,300 books as a result of research done here at the center. Now, that may make the place sound like an ivory tower, and it looks like an ivory tower, but we didn't want it to be an ivory tower. We wanted it to connect with all sorts of audiences, and we were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a variety of ways, and if you want to find out how we do that, just go to America in Class, and that will take you to this page. And from this page, you will be able to get access to all of the resources and programs we offer for teachers. Now, when the seminar ends tonight, you can go to the Slavery in the Atlantic World website from which you obtain your readings, and there you can find a recording of the seminar along with a PowerPoint, and we invite you to plunder the PowerPoint, use whatever you see there in your classes if you desire. You will also find an evaluation form. We ask you to please fill that out for us and return it. It is very important. We pay a lot of attention to those evaluations, and we try to improve our programs based on what you tell us. Once we receive that form, we will send you documentation of participation. This will be a letter that you will be able to take to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit your participation in this program warrants. Now, let me tell you how you can participate in the program. Uh, tonight, uh, Jim Sweet will be making some uh, remarks and posing some discussion questions keyed to a presentation of slides. When we stop to ask those questions, we hope that you will respond chat, and the way you do that is to put your cursor in the green box that I've bracketed on the screen, type your message, hit the send button, and your message will appear in the larger chat box above the send box. I will be paying strict attention to the chat, and I'll be bringing it into the conversation as we go along. Please, these seminars really are more interesting when you uh, pose questions and make comments. They really form the heart of the program. Now, our understanding this evening, this is the intellectual goal we're striving for. We hope you'll take this back to your students if you teach this material. And we are going to point out that slavery arrived in the British colonies of North America in the 17th century because of a complex interworkings of economic, political, and social forces in the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, and North America. We have some good questions posed on the forum. Let me uh, review those for you, and we'll be addressing these as we move through the seminar. First, what are we talking about when we speak of the Atlantic world? Second, how did African political and institutional structures and economic developments make slavery possible? What role did the slave trade play in the world economy during the 18th and 19th centuries? What role did New England play in the slave trade? And how can we relate slavery to place? To lead us through those questions this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to have with us James Sweet, Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Jim was a National Humanities Center Fellow here in 2006 and 7. He's written widely on slavery and the African diaspora. There are a couple of his titles. We weren't able to put all of them up. So let me now turn the program over to Jim, who will tell us about slavery in the Atlantic world. Jim, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Richard, and thank you all so very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to walking you through some of these questions and uh, hopefully coming to a few answers. Um, the, the framing question that we want to start with is, is really one that, that I use in my own classroom, um, mostly because I find that, that the sort of introduction to American history oftentimes starts um, only with American beginnings as though there's something exceptional about the, the American case. So what I want to do is sort of look at this 
this period and this moment in 1619 as an end point in many respects. We'll go beyond it toward the end of, of the night, but what I want to start with is what comes before this. In other words, the context for, for how we get to 1619. So, our framing question for the night uh, is really a very, fairly simple one. It's, it's why and how did the first so-called 20 and odd Negroes arrive in Virginia in 1619? And this is the year which um, is, the, is the first year when Africans actually arrived into the Chesapeake in Virginia. But first, <laughs> um, several of you posed this question about, you know, what do we mean by the Atlantic world? And um, it, it, the definition of the Atlantic world is, uh, is one which emanates out of, out of interests that come after World War II. In other words, um, once the North Atlantic Treaty Organization uh, is, is um, created post-World War II, you have a scholarly sort of reaction to this that, that uh, begins to look at the connections between the, the United States in particular and Europe. Um, so what you have is this emphasis on the contact between North America and Europe. At first, it's mostly the U.S. and Great Britain, but then that expands out into Northern Europe and even eventually into Southern Europe as well. And what, what the scholarship does during this time is, is it begins to, to examine a sort of regional system of, of shared economic and cultural interests um, that cross the Atlantic world. Now, for a very long time, uh, this, this Atlantic history was centered primarily at Harvard University and Johns Hopkins University. Um, and the, it, was, it was primarily taught uh, to historians and, and, and some anthropologists were also embracing this idea. Uh, it was not necessarily uh, gaining widespread currency, I don't think, outside of the academic establishment. Um, and one of the critiques that eventually emerged was that it was, it was very much a political um, entity. In other words, people weren't really thinking about uh, the Atlantic world outside of pure political history. And it was very much centered on North America, on U.S. and, and Northern European interests, sort of old world interests, if you will. Um, within the last decade or so, pro probably closer to 15 or 20 years, there's been a critique which says, look, the Atlantic world is, is interesting in its own right in the North Atlantic, but there's this larger Southern Atlantic world which also interacted. And this is part of a larger expansion into something that many of you may be familiar with, um, that being the, 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 the sort of expansion of world history in the curriculum, both at the high school level and at the secondary level. Um, as you may know, at the university level, we've very slowly begun to embrace the idea of world history as well, uh, such that it's taught as survey courses in much the same way as they are taught in, in many of your secondary schools, I'm sure. Um, so within the last decade, there's been a movement to expand Atlantic history within the sort of intellectual establishment to include those regions of the Atlantic south of the equator, meaning, of course, um, the southern part of the Caribbean, uh, South America down to Brazil, and then on the, on the west coast of Africa going all the way down to South Africa. Um, this has really opened up uh, a different kind of conversation because the South Atlantic trends look a little bit different than those in the North Atlantic, and I hope to explore bits and pieces of that tonight. If not in full, I hope you'll get at least a suggestion of the ways in which um, the South Atlantic is a little bit different than, than, and perhaps even a bit unfamiliar to you um, when you think about the, the North American or the U.S. experience. So altogether then, when, when we think about Atlantic, the Atlantic world and Atlantic history in particular, um, it's, it's in large part um, a, a sort of academic intellectual trend, which, I mean, has, some of you may know it, it, it actually, um, there are prizes given by the American Historical Association from about the past 15 years now for the best book in Atlantic history. So it really has become entrenched. Um, and the, the, the emphasis there tends to be on themes like migration, trade, colonialism, uh, slavery, um, finance capital, a whole range of different things could fall under this rubric. Uh, but some of the most exciting scholarship that's produced nowadays in the history profession, I think, um, falls under this rubric. Of course, um, many people could claim Atlantic, uh, even if they're working on a small part of the world. But generally speaking, what we like to think about when we talk about Atlantic or compar our comparative or interactive types of history, and that's certainly where I'm going to spend much of my time tonight. Jim, in past seminars, we've had teachers ask how they could globalize American history, and it seems to me this would be an ideal way in which to do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my my starting premise tonight actually is it, it flows from from that very um, uh, question, that very idea. Uh, my own training, my own background is not necessarily as a North American historian. I'm deeply interested in, in North American history, particularly as it relates to slavery and the slave trade, but my own interests are actually more in West Africa and more in Latin America, particularly in Brazil. Uh, so what I've always tried to do is to both um, help train my North American colleagues that, that, you know, that this is a bigger world. We don't need to start with American questions, um, but also that American the American experience is one which um, is actually illuminated by by these larger global um, experiences, and so we're just going to take a very small slice of that tonight, hopefully. And um, I think it I think it's a very clever way of integrating um, a more global look at at slavery into the classroom um, in thinking about North American or or U.S. slavery. Jim, let me ask you to do this not tonight, but uh, after the seminar, if you could think about some titles <clears throat> of some books that might introduce this concept, we can post those to the forum, and teachers who want to pursue this idea will have the resources to do so. Absolutely, and for for what it's worth, there actually are some increasingly there's some very 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 fine um, uh, surveys of of sort of Atlantic history um, in the in the North American context. There are even um, document readers for they're not they're not oftentimes not so good for for the topic of slavery, but there are document readers for Atlantic history more generally. Some of which are are, are, are terrific. So I, I'll be glad to to share those with you. Okay, great. Well, shall we move on then? Surely, let's move along. Um, so, the, when we think about the Atlantic world in the topic of slavery, um, as I was just talking about, for, for, for a very long time, uh, the region we were talking about when we were it was this sort of North Atlantic region that connected North America uh, with Europe, right? So, what we've tried to do, and I don't know, can you, you, you guys can see my pointer, I hope, yes? Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think we can okay. see it. Okay, good. Uh, so, so this this region, sort of, you know, coterminous with North America and pointing out across the Atlantic um, toward um, toward Europe, it was really what we were talking about um, in this much earlier period. But, but nowadays we're we're beginning to focus much more on on the South Atlantic. In other words, looking at South America and particularly its relation to West Central Africa. Um, what this map shows are the major regions and ports involved in the in the transatlantic slave trade. This some of these images tonight, unfortunately, are, are a little bit small. Um, this actually is a is a cross section from a very large large uh, coffee table book, which is full of maps that deal with the transatlantic slave trade. It's another one of those titles I'll be glad to share with you guys. It just came out last year and won a number of prizes actually because of, of its thorough treatment of of slavery and the slave trade. So I, I'll be glad to share that. Um, Cite, a citation as well. But what you see here, and, and I'll, what I'll do is just very quickly point to a few um, important um, places. Obviously, our sort of starting point tonight is here in the Chesapeake um, in 1619. I will be talking uh, at some length about, uh, about Portuguese influences, um, Spanish influences. Uh, I'll be talking obviously about Great Britain. But this is a story that also encompasses the Dutch. Um, it encompasses uh, uh, West Central Africa, or you'll hear me use a shorthand, I'll call this Angola more often than not, because this is where um, many of, of, of uh, the Africans who arrive into North America in the 17th century, in fact, the vast majority actually come from West Central Africa. Uh, so the story I will be telling tonight, as much as it, as much as it, 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 it sort of, in the American history books, it starts in 1619 in this spot, it includes uh, Portugal, Spain, Holland, Great Britain, Angola, and there's a Caribbean aspect to the story because the ship that takes those those first Africans to the Chesapeake are actually passing through the Caribbean at the time, and they're actually they're interestingly on their way to Mexico to Veracruz. So it it truly is a, a, an Atlantic story, and so that's the story I want to try to share with you tonight. I think I've just said all of these things, so I'll just go through them very quickly. Uh, the path, if you will, to the dock at Jamestown was, as I, as I mentioned, thoroughly Atlantic. Um, it, it, it goes through Africa, it goes through Portugal, it goes to the Netherlands, and it goes through Britain. Um, interestingly, also, it, it, is, it involves a series of imperial rivalries that had been going on and extending back, um, arguably, to the 15th century, but certainly throughout the 16th century. Um, and it depended on the economics of empire and the expanding empires um, of northern Europe during this time. So 
Um, you'll hear me talk about uh, the rivalries, for instance, between uh, Spain and Portugal up and against Holland and Great Britain. Um, the particular ship that carries the first Africans to, to the Chesapeake um, is one which is contested by, by this rivalry. So how does this actually happen? How does it unfold? Uh, those first so-called 20 and odd that, that arrive in, into Jamestown in 1619 arrive on a Portuguese ship um, whose name was São João Batista. Uh, this ship had embarked uh, 350 Africans in Angola. Uh, these Africans were bound for the port of Veracruz in what is today Mexico. Uh, within the colony of New Spain, a Spanish colony. Um, and you may ask yourself, what, you know, why were so many Africans going to, to Veracruz? Well, Veracruz um, in the 17th century was one of the largest sugar planting regions in the Americas. So those uh, Africans were going there. And we'll talk shortly about you know, what were all of these Africans doing who were arriving into the Americas before 1619. Uh, those who were going to Veracruz were going to work in sugar plantations. Um, on the way, the Portuguese ship was intercepted by Dutch and English privateers, uh, pirates, if you will, who captured the ship in the Caribbean. Uh, those pirates confiscated around 50 of those 350 slaves and eventually carried that, that, that small lot, that 20 and odd, to Virginia, and the remainder went on to Bermuda. All of the remaining slaves, I should say, uh, a portion of the remaining 350 people who, who it takes some time to gather along the Angolan coast before that ship is loaded. So they probably get to know one another. Some of them may have already been familiar with one another beforehand. Even they may have been family. They may have been friends. Uh, but along the way, they become subject to these different imperial rivalries. They get siphoned off. 50, go to, you know, 50 are taken off of the ship by this combined uh, Dutch and English privateering company. Part of them are taken to Virginia, another part are taken to Bermuda. The remainder, a large portion of them die, and the remainder wind up in Mexico. So a people who had sort of created themselves as one on board this ship were again broken up into different pieces all over again, yet they all came from the same place. So this raises the question of, you know, how do these folks who, who have a basic um, common understanding, history, and background in Angola, how do they become American and what are the differences in their becoming America in a place like Jamestown versus a place like Bermuda versus a place like Mexico? Uh, and this is to say nothing of a place like, like Brazil, which I'll talk about shortly, where the vast majority of Angolans went during the 17th century. Hey, Jim, we have uh, two questions here. One of them we're going to answer right now, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And that question is, mm -hmm. what was the situation in Africa that allowed for this exploration to be so widespread? We mm -hmm. have another question here, and I'm willing to bet this comes from a lady in Florida. Were there mm -hmm. any African slaves in St. Augustine prior to 1619? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, there were. Uh, so this is, you're posing an, an, a, a wonderful question. This is another place where when, when you ask the question about North American or American history, um, do we, is American history coterminous with British colonization? And of course, if you ask me, that answer is no. Uh, and if that's the case, then actually the, our history of slavery in, the Amer in, in North America uh, begins even before St. Augustine. Um, arguably, arguably, it begins with um, the story of Estebanico or Esteban, however you want to, many of you may be familiar with this story. I won't go into great detail, um, but Esteban was one of the um, earliest explorers, actually, of the Gulf Coast of, of, of North America. Um, he was part of a an exploratory contingent of Spaniards who, in the first decade of the of the 16th century, uh, went along the Gulf Coast of Florida and into Louisiana and Alabama, and then eventually um, around the Gulf Coast of Texas. Um, and we suspect that he was the slave of one of these um, con conquistadores, and, and um, eventually was um, actually one of the first explorers who, who once he went into the interior of Texas, wound up even in the western part of the United States all the way to New Mexico um, before he was eventually killed by Native Americans. Uh, it's a very brief sort of synopsis, but the point here is that the question is absolutely appropriate. Um, the Spanish were in North America, had colonized parts of Florida long before the British arrived in, into Virginia. Uh, and yes, there were, there were slaves um, in St. Augustine. Um, in fact, there was a fairly large runaway community that existed by, by the late 16th century, um, which 
um, there is now actually a, a an archaeological site at this site called Mose, just north of St. Augustine, um, where these slaves had run to. And there's a very rich history of the African presence in, in St. Augustine. And it's been written about by some very fine scholars who I, I won't dwell on right now, but I'll add that to the list of, of bibliography that I need to provide for you guys. <laughs> uh, the other question was was a question that was aimed at Africa. Um, and I, I had you guys read a, a short piece on on um, the sort of political and um, economic situation in Africa, but I didn't I, I did there wasn't a great deal of detail on that. So let me say a bit about. Uh, the, the circumstances on the African side that allowed for the expansion of slavery. Um, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that, that um, in most African societies, indeed all that we know of, um, there was an absence of the kind of private property in, in, in land that we understand um, in, in the Americas and in Europe um, um, in modern day society. So people didn't actually own the right to land. You didn't fence off your property and raise your goods and claim that, you know, claim absolute ownership over that property. Rather, the property was shared um, and you only used what was necessary for you and your dependent survival. Now, that's not to say that people didn't try to build and expand their wealth, um, but wealth was measured in the number of dependents and people that you could support. So wealth building was was through the rubric of property and people. Now, I use the term property here very loosely because I include under this rubric, obviously, and you'll see on the slide here, um, wives, children, pawns, adoptees, and slaves. So this is sort of a sliding scale of dependency. Um, and I say wives in the plural here because many of these were uh, polygynous societies, so men would actually, um, expressions of their wealth were made through the number of wives that they had, the number of children that they had, uh, and then in addition to that, you had these other categories of people who were who were pawns, who they would buy in exchange for a debt that was owed to them by someone else. So they would actually, you know, have people at their disposal to help cover um, debts that were owed to them. They might adopt people into their into their kinship group, um, who, you know, in, in this sliding scale of dependency, were pretty low on the totem pole. They they obviously weren't related by blood, um, but they could work their way for if they had certain kinds of skills. Um, there's there's very good scholarship on the African sides, which suggests that um, African big men in particular, chiefs, if you will, to, to, to use sort of colloquial terms, um, tried to create composite societies of intellectuals, people with certain skills. In other words, you wanted you wanted to have a set of skills that could make you as as a leader embellish your power. So you wanted the best blacksmith, you wanted the best hunters, you wanted the best medicine men, and so on. So these people could be integrated into these societies and become like kin, become like family. Um, and slaves were not excluded from this from this rubric. If slaves proved that they had certain skills that, that would, were beneficial to the larger group, then they would eventually, over time, transcend their status as the most abject people in society. And we have... Um, numerous examples across Africa, particularly uh, of slaves who achieve um, prominence through through military service, through warfare. Uh, so there, there, large contingents of slaves would be employed in warfare, and then those who perform most admirably um, would be would achieve greater status. They would achieve rights to 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 people, to land, to wives, and so on. Uh, so there were there were possibilities in Africa for slaves to be able to transcend their uh, their status however and i and i this is a very sharp however uh the general consensus was that slaves were were um were were the at the lowest end of this dependency scale and that in many cases for instance in islamic west africa particularly in in senegambia um in 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 parts of moving further south into Sierra Leone and, and Liberia and those regions, Guinea-Bissau. Um, in many of those regions, the stigma of slavery would transcend generations. In other words, people would know by the names that were applied to people whether they had been born into slave families. So even though one might achieve social prominence, every in many cases, people would still know that you came from a slave family. 
So there was some ambivalence in all of this. I don't mean to suggest that, that people ever completely transcended that. Um, but that being said, the status itself was one of many forms of dependency, and there was enough flexibility within this system for people to be able to, to, to operate within it and to move past this idea of being the most abject. Uh, and I think that the transformation that occurs when we move toward, toward Atlantic slavery and transatlantic slavery and the idea of people as chattel um, is that once you become a piece of property, once you become an absolute piece of property who is bought and sold, traded for goods, traded for money, um, your, your likelihood of being able to transcend that status um, diminishes greatly. Um, and you, you're going to have to somehow be able to build the capital in order to, to redeem yourself from that. Um, Jim, so the key here is to sure, oh, – sure, We have a question here, then, and your, your comment about chattel opens on to this question. Who mm -hmm. decided exactly which Africans were sold as slaves? Now, let me break that into two questions. First of all, mm -hmm. who, who decided you know, who became slaves? And secondly, I think you just answered the question. In Africa, were slaves sold? I mean, what, what you're suggesting here is that in Africa, they were not chattel. That's mm -hmm. a new development mm -hmm. in the new world, right? Right, right. Yeah, okay, so, so um, let, me la let me answer your last question first. Um, the, prior to the arrival of, of Europeans, um, it's true that Africans were not sold. In other words, um, th there, were, there were exchanges um, of people which would take place uh, in a variety of different settings. I mean, more often than not, the way that slaves were, were obtained, um, well, both before and after Europeans arrived, was through warfare. Um, so I, I think the idea that, that Africa was this sort of peaceful, tranquil place prior to the arrival of Europeans is, is misguided. Africa, um, much like Europe and Asia and all of the parts of the world, Africans had political conflicts. Uh, and by virtue of those conflicts, uh, people were taken captives. People were taken as prisoners of war. And um, many of them were, were made into slaves. Uh, so that's one way that people were, 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 were turned into slaves. Um, there were instances, I mean, I, I mentioned pawning, for instance. So there, there were instances which, which approximate or come very close to, to people being bought and sold as slaves. And this is why pawns are really an interesting category, because um, what would happen, I mean, and we know now that, I mean, there's, new, there's very new um, research being done that's showing that people actually pawn, oftentimes pawn their children. In other words, they might owe someone a debt. Um, whether that's a debt for, for food or uh, whether that's a – it could be an, an, another human debt even. In other words, maybe my, my group of people killed one of your people by accident, and I therefore owe you in, 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 in for, you know, it's compensation for that. So I will pawn one of my children to you for a period of time until I can pay you back in kind. Um, and that pawn is – I mean, is that pawn a slave? Is he, is he or she treated like a slave, or is he treated like a kin, or is he protected? Um, these are variable sort. I mean, the question of treatment is something else altogether. So, um, this this question about um, about how who how slaves were actually produced in pre-colonial Africa is 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 a complicated one. Um, but I, I would say the easiest way to answer this is to say that, that, that the majority of folks were who became slaves were were enslaved as a result of of, of warfare between competing peoples. Um, the, the second question, which um, you're going to have to remind me again, Richard, sorry. Um, well, uh, that was who, who decided who became a slave and who did who not decided. become a slave. Right. Um, those, again, are sort of variable questions. In some parts of Africa, uh, you, you had um, – in, in, in many places, you had women who were protected by local men. In other words, uh, during bouts of warfare, women would be integrated into the kinship group of the, the conquering society, and men would be sold into the slave trade. That was the norm across much of West Africa during this time period. So the decision was, was, um, was a practical one. Um, you wanted to expand your, your, um, your kin group through through natural reproduction. So you would integrate women in, you would expand your, the number of wives that you had, and you would ship the men off into the Atlantic straight slave trade. This had profound implications, by the way, on the demography of the slave trade to the Americas. We know, for instance, that um, across the trade, two out of three slaves, Africans that arrived in the Americas were men, uh, which, as you might imagine, completely skews and changes the possibilities for creating social life um, in the Americas. But setting that aside just for a moment, um, 
in, in, in periods of warfare, the, the decision about who would actually be enslaved uh, was oftentimes a, an arbitrary one made by, made, by the, by, made by the king. I mean, I can think, for instance, in the case of, of, of Dahomey in the 18th century, um, when, when the Dahomey military would, would make incursions and go and take prisoners, they would go back to, to, to their home city and stand before their king Agaja, and he would pass judgment. Um, there would be ritual slaughters, literally executions of large numbers of, of, of these captives or of these um, prisoners of war. But then others would be sold into the slave trade. So uh, in many cases, it was arbitrary decision on the part of, 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 of a king. Um, the, when I say arbitrary, it wasn't always completely arbitrary either because um, there was a special sort of treatment given to, to the most powerful warriors in, in, in competing societies, political figures. Um, they were executed in a very ritualistic fashion. Um, in the case of, of Dahomey, they would actually take their, their bones and their blood and integrate them into their, into their buildings and their totems as a, as a sort of sacrifice to the king and his ancestors. So th there were ritualized ways of, 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 of completing warfare. Uh, of which the slave trade was only one part of that. So uh, warfare is, is the primary sort of mode of production for slaves um, in the um, both pre-colonial and certainly after Europeans arrived. Um, while, I'm, while I'm on this topic, let me go ahead and finish it off by saying that um, some of you may be wondering, all right, you know, so what actually changes then when, when Europeans arrive? Um, there is a fundamental transformation with the arrival of Europeans insofar as when Europeans arrive along the coast, they bring certain trade goods that were not available in Africa prior to the time um, of European arrivals. And what I mean by this are, are uh, guns in particular, like um, accurate guns, very accurate guns in large numbers. I mean, uh, Africans had, had, had had access and had known guns prior to this time, but not in such great numbers. Um, swords. Alcohol, there were a range of different sort of detrimental products that arrive along the coast. The guns being the most obvious that 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 create imbalances, political imbalances in Africa itself. I like to use the the, the case of 16th century Senegambia um, as my primary example. There you had a situation, and this this occurred all over the west coast of Africa, by the way. But in, in the early 16th century, you had a situation where, in the interior of Senegambia, there was a kingdom called the Wolof Kingdom. Um, it was about 300, the center of the Wolof Kingdom was about three to 400 miles into the interior of Africa. And it, its major nexus was the Trans-Saharan trade, which was the, the sort of super highway for, for economic um, exchange prior to the, to the opening up of the Atlantic. So if you can imagine the, the sort of trade between North Africa and the Mediterranean and then Sub-Saharan Africa crossing over the desert, most of the major trade centers for West Africa were aligned along the sort of Southern Sahara. So it makes sense that, you know, if you do the sort of uh, the geographical map that, it, you know, that the center of economic power in Senegambia would be in the interior. So what happens? Well, the Portuguese arrive with their guns and their alcohol and the coastal people, the Bao, the Wall, a, a, a number of people who had been paying tribute to Wolof in the interior, all of a sudden have wealth and power that they didn't know prior to this time. And they're able to challenge the supremacy of Wolof. They go to war. It's really convenient for the Europeans because what happens when, when Africans go to war? They produce slaves. Uh, so there's an interesting dynamic that happens here, and I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting that there was intent. Europeans were trading, um, but the consequences of that trade were that, in, in many instances, warfare increased. It created economic and social imbalances. It created warfare. That created more slaves. So it was an interesting cycle that occurs here. That um, um, that um, you know, the, it, many people like to play the blame game. It's really hard to pin blame here. Um, there were lots of bad guys, and um, sort of um, unintended consequences in many of these instances. So I've lingered on this. Um, was slavery a peculiar form of dependency or was it simply one in a spectrum of dependent statuses? I think I've sort of answered that. Uh, have I answered that fairly adequately? I, I, I think, think so, Jim. Wrong, yeah. We should move ahead. But before we do, we've got a couple of questions here sure. by way of review. And we can dispense with these, I think, rather quickly. First, did large Perfect. dependents equal military and political power? And I think you said the answer to that was yes, they did, right? Yeah. Of course, yes. Okay, uh, and then uh, another question here, sort of by way of review. What was the future of an African slave? And they, you said that they could become part of a family. Sometimes they could work their way out of the status of the most abject. Would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, and absolutely here's a, fair. 
Okay, another question here. Did non-slaves uh, feel that they had to participate in the slave trade? Maybe another way of asking that question was, how far down the social scale did slaveholding go in Africa? I know you mentioned chiefs and sort of the royals mm -hmm. of, of an African tribe. What about the mm -hmm. common folks? Did they, did they get slaves too? All right, here, let's think of it this way. Um, slaves had wives, slaves had children, slaves had slaves. In other words, I know this may sound, it may be confounding to us. Um, it, it might be less confounding if you knew that it actually happened in other parts of the Americas as well. There, there's some very strange things happen outside of the American context, and, it, and I think it shines light on, on the institution of slavery in ways that I think many of us are probably not necessarily familiar with. So I, I think maybe the best way of thinking of it is to say that um, even, the, even the most abject person desired to have power, right, and wealth, and wealth in Africa during this time was defined by the number of people who surrounded you. And this isn't so far off of the way I think that we think about our own lives, right? I mean, we, we, or at least not so long ago, we tried to surround ourselves, not, you know, maybe several generations ago, but less so in this sort of technological age where we walk around with our iPhones and our heads buried in them all the time. But um, a few generations ago, what was valuable to us was the number of people around us who we could depend on in times of need, who could help us, you know, make our farm productive and so on, right? So we tried to build large families. And if you think of wealth in those terms, I think that one comes to a better understanding of the way that, that, that Africans did, and for that matter, still do understand um, relationships of dependency. I also want to underscore the fact that just because you were a slave did not mean that your master didn't owe you some sort of uh, compensation. Reciprocity is extraordinarily important here. So um, even in contemporary Africa, you find, I mean, when I travel there, it, it, or many Americans when they travel to Africa, they're all, oftentimes disturbed by the number of people who seem to be in subservient positions. Um, you can go and you can find yourself being served in all sorts of settings that you wouldn't normally be served in the U.S. Um, and it can be very disconcerting. Um, but when you realize that, you know, that, 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 that reciprocity is expected, that you're supposed to pay for these services, and this is the way that people make their living, um, you start to come to an understanding that, that reciprocal relationships between masters and slaves or um, masters and dependents or employers and dependents, again, this is a sliding scale, um, that even the very lowest person is desiring at some point to try to build enough capital, whether that's actual, you know, monetary capital once we arrive on the American side, um, or whether that's uh, social capital on the African side where you can marry, you can have children, you can build enough of a, cor a corpus of power on your own to be able to integrate new people into your kinship group. Um, and getting back to the earlier question about sort of the, um, the big dependents, um, it's absolutely true. You want to build this sort of, you, you start small, but you want to build this composite society. Um, and the most valuable people are the ones who are the hardest to integrate into your, into your group. I mean, they're the ones who have skills that are desired by others. Uh, so at that juncture, of course, you're talking much less about, about dependency than you are about what the individual has to offer to the group. I mean, it's a, it's a negotiation in many respects. Uh, so there's a sliding scale of skills that go into this as well. Jim, we've got a number of questions, but I think we should move on. I will, I will promise if we have time, I'll get back to these questions, but uh, we've got a little under an hour, so why don't we, why don't we move ahead? Okay. Um, so I'll transition out of Africa. I, I'll be happy to come back and, and, and entertain some of those questions. They're crucial. I mean, I could spend an entire uh, course period here on just the African context. I mean, in fact, it would probably be instructive for many of you to, for me to do more sort of close case studies, but that unfortunately is not our, our goal for tonight. I'm simply trying to give you a, 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 a big picture view of how we get to 1619. So in order to sort of push forward on that, um, in this, in this particular slide, what I've, what I've tried to do is, is to get you to, 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 to walk you through, if you will, the chronology of of the, the Atlantic, the transatlantic slave trade. As, as I mentioned before, the, um, the slave trade that existed prior to the 1440s was one that, that, that primarily crossed um, over the, the Sahara. So in other words, it moved from these regions that you, that you see in, in, in shading um, across the Sahara and into the northern regions of Africa and then on into the Mediterranean. Now, 
what happens in the 1440s is that Portuguese explorers leave from, from Western Portugal. Uh, they go down, they course down the African coast, and they land about here in Senegambia. Now, what you have demarcated on this map are a series of regions that are oftentimes referred to in shorthand by scholars as sort of socially and culturally and politically, well, politically less so, socially and culturally cohesive regions. In fact, politically, they're quite divisive, and that's what creates lays. Um, but these regions are, are here in sort of order. You see um, Senegambia, they're hard to read, so I'll read them for you. Senegambia, Sierra Leone, the Windward Coast, the Gold Coast, which is contemporary Ghana primarily, the Bight of Benin, uh, the Bight of Biafra, which, uh, and the Bight of Benin and Bight of Biafra straddle contemporary Nigeria, which is, of course, the, the country with the largest number of Africans um, in the world. And then West Central Africa, Angola, um, oftentimes referred to. Southeast Africa, uh, oftentimes shorthanded as Mozambique. And you can imagine the, um, the journey that one would have to take leaving the eastern coast of Africa around the Cape of Good Hope uh, and then all the way up to either Brazil or the Caribbean or even in some extraordinary cases all the way up to the Gulf Coast of the United States. Now, for our purposes, what's important is to look at the trends prior to 1619. So, um, the first African slaves via the Atlantic went to Portugal in the 1440s. And these very first incursions, um, the Portuguese actually stole, if you will. I mean, this is this is sort of part of the legend that we hear that the Europeans went and stole Africans. And um, that did happen in the first uh, first one or two journeys down the African coast. The Portuguese were looking for gold. They were looking for um, wealth and riches. And when they went to, down the West African coast and didn't find those things, uh, these explorers decided that they needed to go back with some sort of um, something to show for their for their travels. So they grabbed a, 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 a small handful of Africans and took them back to Portugal. Um, some of these figures actually were became trained in, in, in the Portuguese language. They were converted to Catholicism. And some were actually sent back to Senegambia to serve as emissaries on behalf of the Portuguese government. Others, however, stayed in Portugal as slaves. Um, between the 1440s and 1518, 1518 being the year when the first Africans go from Africa itself to the Americas directly. Prior to that time, all of the Africans who had gone to the Americas, including Esteban Nico, who I mentioned earlier, and those, um, those very earliest Africans who went to the Spanish and Portuguese Americas, mostly Spanish Americas, um, were going via Spain and Portugal. So in 1518, the first Africans go directly from Africa to the Americas. So between 1440s and 1518, more than 150,000 Africans went to Europe and Europe's Atlantic Islands. And by the Atlantic Islands, I mean Sao Tome and Cape Verde in particular, more especially uh, Sao Tome, which um, there is some information in the readings about Sao Tome, a little more detail there that you can um, learn about a large sugar planting society, a, a real precursor to what would emerge in the Americas already in Sao Tome by the first decades of the 16th century. Now, what's interesting, I think, for our purposes is that the vast majority of these Africans who went to Europe in the, in the late 15th and early 16th century were from Senegambia, from this region here. Um, maybe you can't see that. How is that? <laughs> um, so, and the, the, the majority of them were familiar with Islam. Now, we know this through a number of different um, ways. Um, there are a number of inquisition documents from Spain and Portugal, which go about prosecuting some of these Senegambian Africans for practicing Islam. As many of you probably know, um, the Spanish and the Portuguese were quite fond of their inquisition, mostly to root out um, heresies of Judaism. Uh, but they were also expelling Muslims during this time. And so Africans get caught up in this net, and most of them are slaves. Um, now, what's interesting for our purposes, again, I think, is the, is the idea that uh, some of the earliest slaves who arrive first in Europe and then later in the Americas, for the, all the way up until about the 1550s, 1560s, even into the 1570s, the majority of Africans who are going to places like Mexico, uh, early Brazil, Peru, um, I'll show you images in just a second from all of these places. But the majority of these are coming from heavily Islamic regions. And I'm just curious what you guys might think. I mean, if you, if you imagine early American history as a history that is one made up mostly of indigenous people or made up of sort of early European explorers, how does the history of the Americas change or how is it, how is it reconfigured through um, understandings that literally tens of thousands of Islamic Africans uh, 
um, appeared in the Americas prior to 1690. Um, and, and the reason I ask this question, of course, is it's, it's, it's very much a post 9-11 question because I think we think of Islam in the Americas in a very particular kind of way uh, in a post 9-11 world. Uh, with, with, in the absence of any real kind of history, right? So what, is it, what does it mean to, to think about Islam in Africa, an Islam that had been there um, since the, at least the ninth century, uh, and not, not, a, not an orthodox Islam like you might see in Saudi Arabia, but a, a very much an Africanized Islam uh, that, that still pays attention to ancestors even as it, 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 it pays attention to um, the requirements of, of Islam. Um, the, the prayer requirements, the fasting requirements, um, um, the knowledge of the Shahada, all of these things are very important to these slaves, even in the American context. Uh, so it's something to raise with your, with your students, I think, um, who I think, are, because they are brought up in this post-9-11 world, probably have a particular understanding of Islam. Okay, any comments on that? I mean, how, how does the knowledge that <clears throat> in the Americas we had a substantial uh, Islamic presence <clears throat> early on. How does that change your perception of American history in any way? And Jim, that, that raises a question in my mind while we're waiting for our participants mm -hmm. to respond. If we had such a large uh, Islamic presence early on, what happened to it? I mean, it, you know, most of American history, you really don't have much uh, Islamic presence in the United States. Mm -hmm. It doesn't figure into our history much at all. So what happened? Right. The great question. Um, this very early presence um, in in Latin America primarily, and here I'm talking about um, Veracruz, Mexico City, um, the mining regions of Peru, uh, those those Islamic Africans are integrated into the larger indigenous, mostly indigenous societies actually. They become part of these larger mestizo societies. Uh, and so the religious um, ideas fade away fairly quickly. Now, in other parts of the Americas, including parts of North America, you have pockets of Islam that reemerge, um, particularly in uh, along the South Carolina and Georgia seacoasts. Um, there are fascinating accounts from the 18th century of um, pockets of people who are adherents of Islam, who carry around their prayer rugs with them, who say their prayers at the according times every day, who um, are still literate. They're writing in Arabic to one another. And interestingly, slave masters capitalize on their apartness, their separateness. So they, they, they distinguish themselves from the, from the range of other slaves in the societies. And slave masters turn them into overseers and drivers. Um, so there's an interesting economic um, um, concurrence that, that happens here where masters actually privilege Islamic slaves in 18th century Georgia and South Carolina. It's a fascinating story. Um, and one other one other case that that I think is a very prominent one is, and some of you some of you may be familiar with it, and that is the case of uh, Job bin Solomon, who actually is a man who there, there's an image of him. If I I mean it's 18th century, so I didn't I didn't actually expound on that for for my presentation here. But if you guys look up the name Job bin Solomon, I'll actually I think I can write that in here for you guys. Um, that's how it looks. Although sometimes it's 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 um, his last name is Suleiman. They will they will give it in the sort of Islamic version. If you look up that name in a Google search, you will find um, a, a sort of story about him, his 18th century story, in which he's enslaved. Um, I believe it was in Maryland, and he runs away from his master, and he's jailed. And he actually gives an account to to a person telling his story, how he was a, a trader, an Islamic trader in West Africa. Um, and he's eventually purchased, um, he's freed, if you will, and then taken to England and sort of taken around on tour. And there's a, there's a magnificent painting of him that exists, I believe it's in the British Museum, uh, in which he's sort of depicted in this combination of both Islamic and, and sort of contemporary European clothing. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating picture, and the story itself is also a fascinating one. Um, so that, there's another instance in which sort of Islam impinges on American history, at least in the 18th century, in a very um, fascinating sort of way. There you, go. We, we need there you go. Thank you. You're, you're helping me out. <laughs> okay. We, we need to move on, but there is one question, a very important question that we need to address uh, quickly. What evidence uh -huh. is there of Islamic practice continuing in the slave culture? You, you mentioned that you had uh, Muslim slaves on the coast of South Carolina. Is there any evidence, for example, there that we can point to to show Islamic practice surviving uh, in that culture? 
Yeah, um, there's there's a fact there's a, a fantastic um, description of the evolution of, of of Islam in the in the Low Country of South Carolina and Georgia uh, by Michael Gomez actually, in which he 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 unfolds this story of by generation, actually, of this Islamic community and how over the generations it becomes fused into a sort of um, evangelical Christianity. But he also argues that, that the sort of residues of the Islamic past remain in the Low Country all the way into the late 19th century, so much so, he says, that he thinks that the descendants of, of these slaves actually um, – influenced the, um, the reemergence, if you will, of Islam among African Americans in the 20th century. Indeed, he makes a connection between these earliest, um, these earliest African expressions in the Low Country and the emergence of the Nation of Islam and its various earlier iterations in the first three decades of the 20th century. In other words, um, that, that the descendants of people like, um, um, oh gosh, what, um, I'm not. I'm losing my head now. Wallace Fard, and there, there, there's a series of figures um, in the 20, in the early 20th century, who become the precursors to the Nation of Islam. Um, and Gomez actually argues that their ancestors had come from the Low Country of Georgia, and he tries to tries to show how Islam actually the residues of it um, persist in American history. So there, there is a story to be told there, and that's another one of those um, readings that I can pass on to you guys. Okay, great. Well, shall we move on then? Okay, great. Well, shall we move on? Absolutely. All right. So um, I've just given you a story about uh, or a brief narrative about how 150,000 Africans had arrived into Europe and the Atlantic Islands uh, prior to 1518. Now, that 150,000 people equates to about I mean, it, it's just a little under half of the number of Africans that would come to what became the United States over the entire period of the slave trade. So it's an extraordinary number of people, this 150,000. And you may say to yourself, you know, where are they going and what are they doing and what are they looking like? Um, this is an image from Lisbon, central Lisbon in the 1550s in Portugal. And it's, 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 a, it's a fantastically rich and sort of uh, mind-boggling, um, mind-bogglingly detailed painting. So it's hard to unravel. So what I hope to do here is just point to a few images. You can see that it's chock full of, of people of African descent. Um, and so what I ask here are a series of questions that I think you might be able to use productively in your classrooms. Um, I would urge you to take, the, take note here of the, of the name, the citation name. You can get this image in a larger sort of version that, 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 that I think might be more helpful for you. Um, the title of the painting is, it's the King's Fountain, basically, is how that translates. And the fountains themselves are actually here underneath these arcs. They're very difficult to see, but there are, there are women actually gathering water. There's water spewing out of these little figures right here. They're like little dragon heads or things. And so the water comes out of their mouths and people are gathering water. But in the foreground, you see a whole range of, of, of different things going on. I will start, I didn't mean to do that one. I'll start down here at the very bottom. Um, you see a young African, uh, appears to be a, a young boy with a tambourine in one of these boats. And uh, these boats uh, become interesting to my story simply because many of the Africans who, the West Africans who arrive into Portugal actually go there and become boatsmen. They're fishermen. Um, and this provides the opportunity for some of them, um, and I've written about, and actually some of this I wrote about in the article that you guys read, uh, becomes an occasion for them to steal these boats and try to go back to North Africa. And in some cases, they actually succeeded in doing so. And more often than not, when they were able to do this, they did so collectively. They were, they were mostly Wolof speakers. They were, had created sort of small kinship groups among one another and decided collectively that they were going to run back to North Africa. So here you see this young African in a boat with a tambourine. Um, here on the left-hand side, I don't, maybe I should, eh, can you guys see that? I'm sort of off the screen, I know, but um, here you see uh, um, deputies, officers of justice carrying away an African man um, for some offense. Um, this image here is one of the most peculiar ones. Uh, I still don't, I still have not heard an adequate explanation of it. I saw one art historian who said that this was a man who was drunk, but um, it, it, he looks like he has a bucket on his head and there's something dripping out of the bucket. He looks in duress to me. He doesn't look at all drunk. So I, I'm not exactly sure what's happening here, but um, if any of you can figure it out, you'll, you'll win the prize for the night. <laughs> um, more, more interestingly here, though, and this, this is um, perhaps surprising in some ways for many, um, 
here you see a, an African man who is on horseback, which on its very face is an indication of, of high social status. In other words, it wasn't just anyone who could, who could ride horses through urban areas during this time. You had to be someone of distinction. Um, the other thing that's notable here is that, that, that this particular gentleman is wearing the, the, the clothing of someone who is um, a member of the Order of Santiago. So he was a member of a, of a, of a religious and military brotherhood that it had extraordinary prominence in Iberia during this time. Um, what this indicates to us is that, uh, you know, much as in Africa itself, those who had been enslaved or the descendants of slave, uh, slaves had opportunities to transcend their status. Um, these were rare opportunities, but they did exist. So, you know, in this sea of people who appear to be subservient, you see large numbers of African women carrying um, water buckets on their head, particularly in the background of these images. And they're all over the place here. There you can see them here and here. Um, the women in the windows are white women away from the fray. Uh, they're, and they're in almost all of these windows. They're looking down on the hoi polloi, as it were. It's a very, it's very rich in terms of its sort of class implications as well. But um, the streets uh, in, in Portugal, much as they were in urban Brazil and urban parts of Latin America, were the streets were left to, to slaves, servants, um, and um, merchant people. And then in some cases, elite men, most often on horseback. One other image here that's really interesting, and it's difficult to see, but right here, this African man, I don't know if you can see him, um, but he's dancing. He's barefoot, and he's dancing with a, a white woman um, who has uh, another one of these wraps on her head. So this is, an, this is a very rich image. You see lots of people who are in positions of servitude, but you also see some social leavening in the, in the image. I mean, you see this, this man who is on horseback, you know, of the Order of Santiago. You see an African man dancing with a Portuguese woman. Uh, you, you know, you see an, a young African boy with, with two Portuguese, it looks like two Portuguese women, playing a musical instrument in the boat. So there seems to be um, some exchange going on here that um, we might not normally associate with, um, with the sort of most abject um, slave society. So 16th century Lisbon, if you think of this as a continuum, probably slavery in 16th century Lisbon, um, you know, it doesn't look quite like what you saw um, in pre-colonial Africa, but it looks much more like pre-colonial Africa than it does 19th century Alabama, right? Uh, so I think we've covered all the questions here. I've, I've just gone through them without, you can ask your students these questions, you know, what can you learn about the city's population by looking at this? I mean, this, if you showed them this image without telling them what it was, I'd sort of, you know, I gave this all away before I ever showed it to you. If I just showed you this out of the blue, though, without any explanation, you know, where and when would you assume this was and who are these people? Um, you might assume it's, it's an Islamic scene by the way that people are dressed as well and you wouldn't be completely off the mark because so many of these Africans were Islamic. Um, how are Africans depicted in the painting? Uh, quite complicated ways. What are those Africans doing? We've just talked about that. And what can we discern about the social standing through this image? It's, it's complex, but the majority of them are clearly servants or slaves. Okay, shall we move ahead then? Okay, shall we move ahead then? Sure. So while we're, while we're still on this, this um, early um, European iterations of slavery, I, I want to say a few words about, about, um, about sources. Um, Richard had asked me, you know, when, when we first started putting this unit together, you know, can you come up with some written sources that will help us understand this early period? And the fact is there just aren't that many that are in translation. Um, there, there are one or two that could be fruitfully used, but I find that the images themselves are actually far more rich and, and telling in, in ways. Um, in my own work and research in Lisbon, um, I found that just walking the streets sometimes can give you a wealth of information that the, the, the residents of contemporary Lisbon themselves don't even quite grasp or understand. One of those examples is in this image here, and again, it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, but in order to understand this, you need to know that, that, that in, in 16th century Lisbon, by around 1550, the population of the city was about 10% African. Um, and you, you saw that depicted in the previous image where um, Africans were populating the street. I mean, the, the, the percentage of Africans in that image was probably much higher than that. That's simply a, an expression of who actually went into the streets. It, it was more of a, a social statement. Uh, but overall, the population was about 10% um, enslaved and African. And until the, until the 16th century, the majority of these folks were buried in a common grave outside the city. Um, 1515, the king actually ordered that there be a more permanent gravesite established to accommodate the, the, the Africans who were simply being 
thrown away like waste essentially and being left to to be picked over by by um, by you know dogs and animals and birds it was really horrendous and so the king made a stipulation that there needed to be um, a burial site for for um, for slaves and this particular area came to be known as the Black's Pit or and, and today this is this is still um, signified the street still remains and the name of the street still remains it's um, the, the, the the street of the Black's Pit you know, Postos Negros, which is this street right here um, and it's in a neighborhood which is in the contemporary Paris of Santa Catarina and that neighborhood um, in the 16th and 17th centuries was called Mocambo and <laughs> interestingly the word Mocambo means uh, runaway community in Brazil. It, it, it's, it's literal translation. It's a Kimundu word, a word from ang from the language of Angola, uh, which means hideaway or hideout. So here you have a neighborhood in Lisbon in the 16th century whose name is an, an Angolan word for the word hideout. Um, it tells you volumes, right? This is a place where Africans hit out. This is where they live. Um, and then you have the name you know, this, I, this is a photograph I took uh, five or six years ago. Um, in the same neighborhood as it evolved, it became sort of a working people's cosmopolitan neighborhood. So um, it also became the place where Jews lived. It was a place where um, people would go for um, for any kind of handmade goods. So you have streets that are named after blacksmiths, um, street, streets that are named after cauldron makers, and so on. Um, there's even a street for the sheriff, which is not um, surprising given the sort of um, working class and um, um, tough folks neighborhood that this was, but um, to this day these street names remain. And I think that um, when we think about source material for understanding, particularly the African past in some of these places, um, the the as I say on the slide here, the sources are hidden in plain sight. Uh, we just have to sort of use our imaginations and open our eyes to them. And again, I think this is another way of of, of opening your students' eyes up to to um, to the way we do history or the ways that we might do history differently than simply sitting in some stodgy archive with dusty documents. Um, sometimes they're in the very streets themselves. So that, that helps to address one of the forum questions, Jim. How can we relate slavery, slavery to place? We don't have a lot of time to explore that, but you're suggesting here that one way you can do it would be through place names. So if teachers could um, do that research and then assign it to their students, they may discover that, uh, as you say, signs of slavery are right under their nose, hiding in plain view. Absolutely, and it, it's interesting you raise that question, Richard. I was just um, just last week I was in it was, I was in Jamestown. I was um, there helping out um, with a, a documentary that's being filmed, and I was driven to I mean through the swamps actually where um, where the first Africans had arrived. And as we were driving along, I was looking at the cross street names, and they had names like Pigs Point Court, uh, Brick Bat Road. Wash tub road, you know, these are things. I mean, obviously they're not necessarily speaking to the African past, but the brick bat road certainly speaks about something, um, not necessarily positive, I would say. Uh, and I, I wasn't intentionally doing this. I was just, you know, whiling the time away and looking as these things passed, and they started compiling in my head. And there's a story that emerges there. It's, it's, it's uncanny. Um, so yeah, I mean, the sources are, are are they're everywhere around us if we if we just sort of open our eyes and look. Um, so slavery in Lisbon. Um, you've seen this image, and, and even though the image that the, the image with the number of Africans in it from the 1550s in central Lisbon. And by the way, I don't think I said this, but if any of you've ever been to Lisbon, you can, uh, or even if you have not, you can Google an image of Lisbon, um, uh, the main square in Lisbon today. It, it 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 looks very similar to what you see there architecturally, but the uh, the physical the sort of people presence is very different. So. Um, even though slavery in places like Lisbon allowed for some social flexibility that you saw depicted in there in that particular image, it's also abundantly clear that African slaves were the most socially abject category of laborers in Lisbon. Um, they they were employed in the most arduous forms of labor, including um, you know you see them carrying water to their masters. The, what you don't see in that particular image is the the sort of the trip outward from the homes. Um, every morning, those women would wake up and they would take their masters' waste in in in, in in buckets and go and dump it in the rivers. Then they would take clean buckets and fill them up with water and take fresh water back to the houses. Um, um, th then you also had Africans who were working in shipbuilding. Uh, they were working in cleaning sewers. They were working in land reclamation projects. 
Um, they worked in the king's galleys. They did a whole range of the most difficult labor. Um, and there seems to be little, little um, um, doubt that they were considered the most inferior members of society. Indeed, um, in the 16th century, there was a running, in the early 16th century, there was a running joke among urban um, Lisbonites that um, whenever you passed an African in the streets, you would feign sneezing in order. It was a joke. It was a running joke. Um, and people actually wrote about this, so we know that it, it, it took place with some frequency. Um, so, you know, racism as we understand it even today had its, 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 um, um, its early precursors even in this time in, in, in Europe. So moving along, um, that sort of concludes the, the, the European parts of this. Now, now what I want to do is move forward to the Americas. Um, and what you're going to see here, of course, is that slavery expands um, exponentially once the trade opens up to the Americas. So you add on to that 150,000 who went to Europe and the Atlantic Islands, uh, roughly another 400,000. Uh, and you get 550,000 Africans who'd been distributed around the Atlantic world before 1619. Why? Well, most of them are going because of the economic imperatives that are driving slavery um, in primarily in Latin America. So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to set up here is uh, is a way for you guys to convey to your students that um, those first 20 and odd who arrive in North America and British North America, I've got, to, I've got to be very careful. Thank you for pointing out that the Spanish were here first. You're absolutely right. So I need to be clear. In British North America, um, those first 20 and odd were, were in some ways exceptional for British North America, but in a broader context, they weren't exceptional at all. Um, and so, you know, you, on that very same ship, remember, that were bringing those 350 Angolans, almost half of them wound up working in industries like those we're about to explore. Now, that 20 and odd end up in this very sort of frontier forbidding backwater, and it was truly a backwater in 1619 in the Chesapeake. Um, and so their experiences are fundamentally different than those of, of, of the folks we're about to talk about. So I'm covering ground. I'm getting ahead of myself. Prior to 1619, almost 400,000 Africans had already arrived in Latin America and the Caribbean. What did these, these thousands of Africans do in the Americas? So the first image is one which you may recognize. Um, well, it tells you it's sugar production. You don't. Maybe we shouldn't have told them what these things were, Richard. They could have figured them out. Um, so this image I find incredibly useful because I, I think our understanding of sugar production is probably fairly um, rudimentary. We think of it as um, people go and farm sugar like they farm anything else. But in fact, even as early as the 16th century, sugar was an indus industrial productive um, economic endeavor. There was nothing that was um, sort of um, there was nothing that was common or easy about it. It took skill. It took um, it took bravery. It took strength. Uh, what you see happening here are the various phases of sugar production, and, I, and I'll just point to them very quickly because we are running short of time. But here you see people chopping sugar cane, which many of you may be familiar with. I mean, that's the most obvious um, thing that people did. But then once you chop the cane, people have to carry the cane into um, the, you know, the sort of beginnings of the industrial production. This obviously became more technologically advanced as time passed, but in the earliest years, you had human beings who were rolling, um, rolling the presses, if you will, and squeezing the sugarcane juice out of, out of the actual stalks. That juice would then be transferred into pans, and those pans would then be dumped into large cauldrons, boiling cauldrons, Again, as, as technology advanced, these things be also became more advanced. But those boiling cauldrons, people would skim off the 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 detritus, the the stalks, the dirt, and so on, um, until you had fairly clear um, molasses. Then the, that molasses was poured into these molds. Um, here you see a person pouring them into the molds, and the molds eventually dried. But you had to you had to process the molds. You had to pour water and 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 clear clearing agents through these molds in order for the sugar to become more refined. Otherwise, you would have all sorts of trash or, or darker sugar. To, you know, the quality of the sugar would not be as high. So sugar production was, was, um, was technologically in, intense, 
um, it required a certain level of skill. These these particular individuals um, at the at the back end of the production, their their skills were valued greatly by by slave masters, and indeed their value in the market was much higher than the, than the folks who were just brought into chop cane. So th this is a complicated and complex um, economic endeavor that was already afoot, very well afoot in the Americas by the time. Um, um, the first Africans arrived into Jamestown. So th this is an image from from the Caribbean in the 16th century. Well, James, uh, Jim, the next image is, that slide. is um, if we yeah, could sure. go back to that slide for just a moment, the, the previous slide, if we could go back to that. Yeah. So this slide, sure. teachers could use this slide mm -hmm. to show their students that slaves were not held simply for agricultural purposes. So what you have here, once the sugar is cut, you've got an industrial process. Right. Okay, we had a number of people comment on mm -hmm. the way the slaves looked, and I think as you went ahead to the next slide, we saw that there was a substantial difference between the way these slaves are portrayed and the yeah. people in the next slide. These folks do not look African. So how do you account for that portrayal? Right. How do you account for that portrayal? Yeah, these are, this is a very classical sort of uh, European version of laboring peoples. Uh, and it's and in that regard, it's quite generic. Uh, there's certainly nothing that looks African about the folks in these images. It's important too to to know that um, the, uh, the the author of this particular text um, is was someone who actually had never been to the Americas. So um, there's a fairly strong likelihood that that person didn't even know what Africans looked like. Nevertheless, um, he had enough knowledge about the Americas to write that when the veins of and here he's talking about the the situation the economic situation in the Caribbean when the veins of gold ore have been exhausted the blacks had to work in sugar. So in his mind's eye, uh, these are black folks. Um, and uh, it, like I say, it's a very generic rendering of laboring people. And what I mean by that is to say um, this kind of body, which we may value today uh, for its, its sort of tone and muscle, um, was seen in quite negative ways in, in 16th century Europe because it was the body of a worker. Um, not the body of someone who um, was a person of leisure or a, of, of wealth. Um, so it, 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 it's simply a, a, a generic rendering of someone who didn't really understand or know Africans. Whereas the next image, which is one of, of, of mining, um, was actually uh, drawn by a, a, a sailor who had traveled in, in 17th century Latin America and basically just drew what he saw. And so to that extent, you actually do find um, that the renderings are, 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 are more true to history, if you will. Um, so here you see a very early image of 16th century uh, mining. Um, later images you will find of places like Potosi in, in Peru, where there are entire mountains that are carved up or carved into little cones, almost like huge beehives. Um, and these presented extraordinary dangers to those who were having to dig in them. Um, there would be cave-ins. I mean, these were not mines that were shored up in the ways that, um, um, by no means in the ways that we do these things today, but even in the 19th century, people had enough sense to, to sort of um, shore up the, the, the mines. But people would die of cave-ins and collapses uh, with a fair degree of frequency. Here, this is just basic strip mining from the outside. And um, again, you see that it, this takes um, some degree of skill. Here you see um, the sort of um, extraction and 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 um, then the washing and the um, cleaning out of of of, um, of the excess uh, outside of the ore. Oftentimes they would use uh, quicksilver in order to separate the silver out, so that was also quite dangerous. Um, and then here you see the Spaniard being delivered the actual ore and measuring it out and and preparing it to be. Um, to, to be processed here, it's it's here. You also see part of the process, um, the cooking process, sort of um, burning off, boiling off the um, the, the excess. So again, um, the, in the description here from this particular image is, is how the Negro slaves work and look for gold in the mines of the region called Veragua. This is in Panama, um, and um, it sort of speaks for itself. This next image is is one that I I, I continue to find fascinating. Um, it's one of those. Um, aspects of, of slave labor that, that most of us probably don't know much about, um, and it's pearl diving. Uh, and this may sound quaint, um, but it was qu also quite dangerous. Uh, basically, these ships would, would anchor off coast, um, sometimes in 50, 60 feet of water, and the, those who were enslaved were expected to dive down with these baskets and dig for pearls. Now, here again, that may not sound like such a big deal, but they were expected to, to, to swim into caves to, you know, to, to dig these things out. And they would oftentimes, like divers today sometimes, um, would get stuck and would drown. Now, 
another peril, of course, is that they're not diving with tanks. It's not like they have any any kind of breathing apparatus. Uh, some of the some of the um, the colonials would actually say that these that there were certain pearl divers who could hold their breath. They they claimed that they could hold their breath for between 15 and 20 minutes. Uh, that sounds like a lie to me, but um, who knows? Maybe, you know, certainly they had to have built some sort of extraordinary stamina in order to be able to endure this kind of work. Uh, and they must have been successful or else this wouldn't have continued um, as a, a, a going concern. So, yeah, no goggles either. I see that. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't have it. They were basically naked going down with these, with these baskets and digging for pearls. Jim, um, do you know when this image was so made? You, this is just a very quick... Yeah, this is um this is late 16th century. I don't know the exact date. I want to say 1580s, 1590s. I, 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 for some reason, 1596 pops into my head. Okay. I'm not positive, um, but it's it's in that 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 ballpark. Right. Uh, I sent this in a in a text message to the participants, but the only place the Drake manuscript from which those images are taken is available online is in one of our teaching anthologies called <clears throat> American Beginnings. And there's some wonderful images there that work really well with students. Before we move on, Jim, there is a good question here. Did owners of slaves use apprenticeships uh, to increase the skill level of their slaves, or did they seek to buy people with skill sets intact? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is both. Uh, so um, there were a number of skilled positions, obviously, and here what comes to mind most frequently, for me at least, are, are blacksmiths and cobblers and tailors and people of that nature who would, particularly in urban areas, would buy slaves um, usually very young, in other words, young boys or girls, um, and train them up in their, in their particular artisanal trade. Um, so that that was one avenue, and here I'm talking about the Americas generally, not just in North America. Um, I, like I say, much of my own research is um, in places like Lisbon. It, that that happened. It also happened in places like Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. It happened in Mexico City, um, but it also happened in places like Charleston, uh, places like Richmond. Um, in, in any large city, um, you you would find people slaves being apprenticed. That was not unusual at all. Um, the second question about about um, about the skills, slaves having, bringing skills with them, um, that was also um, not infrequent. And you would have slave masters, th this raises an interesting question about uh, slave masters' desirability for, for particular kinds of slaves, either from particular regions or with particular sets of skills. Um, these slave masters liked to think that they could control uh, the supply of slaves and the quality of the slaves that they received. Um, but in most instances, they could not. And you find in the documents all sorts of contradictory evidence, evidence about um, what they think about slaves' skills and their particularities. So um, just to give you uh, one example, there, the, the, there are um, – throughout the documents for North America, there's the belief that, that, for instance, in the Chesapeake, that Igbo slaves are very good in working tobacco, Igbo being folks from the Bight of Biafra. Um, but – uh, there's also the fear that Biafra slaves um, are more prone to suicide than slaves from other parts of Africa. So you get all of these strange sorts of rumors and mixes of, 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 of um, sort of attitudes towards Africans from particular regions. Um, the one place where this becomes particularly pertinent in the American historiography is in the production of rice. Uh, in South Carolina and Georgia. There is a fairly strong, and I think convincing argument that um, slave masters in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia, where rice production was, was, was greatest, um, intentionally sought Africans from the region that is Senegambia and just south of there um, in Guinea-Bissau because these were rice-producing regions originally. And that it was those Africans who actually brought the skills in producing rice to the low country of South Carolina and made it a viable economic um, 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 endeavor in that region. So there's a debate that goes on there. There are some scholars who say, no, Europeans already have this knowledge and they just brought Africans who might have a little bit of knowledge about it. Then there are others who say, no, the Africans had perfected this knowledge and brought it with them and employed it directly in South Carolina. So the answer to the question is uh, yes and yes. <laughs> yeah, I've seen so, uh, advertisements. Back to my yeah, I've seen advertisements for <clears throat> the arrival of slave ships into Charleston saying that these slaves came from the Rice Coast. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, they did. Um, yeah. In fact, the, the yeah, no, no, there's 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 ample evidence to suggest that, particularly in the earliest years of rice production in South Carolina, that it was those folks from from that region of of, of uh, West Africa who who were sought after by by slave masters. Um, I see. If, I'm going to answer this quick question up here about about um, about lifespan because it's an important one given the given my comments about about apprenticeship. Um, yes, it's true. Uh, for for those who are working, particularly in plantation labor. Uh, lifespans were extraordinarily short, as short as seven years in places like the Caribbean and in sugar producing and rice producing regions. However, in those places where people were apprenticed, um, obviously the conditions were not as grave and the disease environment was not as bad, and so they lived longer. Um, so that, that's sort of the short answer to that. Um, so how do, how do we bring all of these threads together? Um, I've, I've given you sort of a just a, a very very speedy panoramic view of the Atlantic world prior to 1619. Uh, I want to come back to this notion that 350 slaves who departed from Angola on this Portuguese ship. Again, it's a Portuguese ship. It's not an American ship, um, and that ship is bound for a sugar plantation in. Mexico. Now you may ask, why is it going to Mexico? Well, the Portuguese and the Spanish crowns between 1580 and 1640 were were, were unified. So um, essentially, Spain and Portugal were the same, although they maintained certain distinctions. I won't go into that. But the point is, um, the Portuguese and the Spanish were working in combination uh, or in alliance with one another, and therefore this ship is carrying this Portuguese ship is carrying Angolans to Mexico. They encounter a a, a consortium of Dutch and English pirates who um, who board this Portuguese slave ship. They confiscate 50 of those slaves. Um, some of them have already died. Others die. Others continue to die as that ship continues on to Veracruz. This Dutch man of war, or it was actually mistakenly described as a Dutch man of war, it was actually the English ship, um, the treasurer that, that, that originally, I believe, was the treasurer which originally took um, the 20 and odd to Jamestown. Um, and they sold those 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 Africans in Jamestown as slaves to the English colonies, colonists in order to meet their demand for labor. Um, there were those in the colony already who had been involved in the slave trade in the Atlantic. Um, some of them had been among those privateers. Uh, so they were familiar with African slavery. It wasn't as though these Africans arrived there out of the blue and they were just astonished to see them. Uh, there was a context for their arrival, and that context was this broader Atlantic world. Okay, Jim, before we move ahead, we've got... So, uh, Jim, yeah. if I could just interrupt, mm -hmm. sorry, we have two questions here before we move to our final uh, sure. part, and that is, do we know how much slaves cost at Jamestown at this time? Is there any sense of the price that people were paying? That's a good question. No, we have no idea. In fact, this this uh, this adds some ammunition to the argument that that these folks could have been indentured. But the but the um, the document clearly says they were purchased explicitly for the purposes of breeding. I mean, there's uh, human beings aren't like um, aren't like animals. You can't just for I mean, think about it. It's sort of logical. You just can't force people to breed. It doesn't work like that. Now, in, it was in slave masters' interest, obviously, to try to expand through natural reproduction. And we know that slave masters definitely tried to engineer that, the expansion of their slave holdings. So, for instance, um, they would pair, pair people up and say, you know, you will be married. But those marriages didn't necessarily stick. They didn't necessarily work. Um, I've seen examples in Catholic countries, in Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries, where slave masters would actually take, um, you know, three pairs of slaves, six slaves, or even, even eight sometimes to the Catholic Church all at the same time and have them married all together. Now, my suspicion is, is that these are, these are sort of coerced marriages. But on the other hand, you could argue that these are, these are communities of people who've grown close to one another and just have naturally gravitated to one another and may have made communities in ways that, 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 that you know, happen to cohere with the slave master's interests as well. These are very difficult things to, to sort of um, – dig out and understand. We do know that slave masters, you know, it was in their economic interest, absolutely, to try to increase production. But I think we should be very careful about assuming that, you've got to look at this from the slave's perspective as well, to assume that Africans took the role uh, that the slave masters imposed upon them, I think is a very dangerous and slippery slope. We can't assume that just because slave masters wanted people to act as breeders, that they actually embraced those roles. Okay, and now we can thank Carla Garfield for setting us up for the last section of our seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, we did not pay Carla to write this.
I thought that the slaves who were brought to Jamestown in 1619 were sold as indentured servants because the Virginia Company had no legal basis to create slave status. Jim, take it away. Here we go. All right. So um, some there are some scholars to this day. I mean, even in some of the articles I had you guys read, um, and part of the part of the the setup for the folks who had me at Jamestown last week was to to counterpose me against someone who who thinks that um, that the first Africans were indentured servants. Um, they and they argue their their basis for this argument is is precisely that there was no legal precedent for slavery in Great Britain. Just true, um, and thus they must have been treated as indentured servants. Um, and so allegedly slavery developed slowly over time in, in, in British North America um, until 1705 when definitively there's a legal, a legal, there's a law that actually says that slaves are property, that they are chattel. Now, does the evidence support such conclusions? Does the absence of a law defining slavery preclude the treatment of Africans as slaves? My answer to that is no. Um, and in fact, my supposition is that if you can, if you need labor, and you can treat people as slaves without um, any sort of contract, you would do that. I mean, it's in your economic interest to do so, right? And we have absolutely not one whit of evidence that Africans signed contracts for indenture. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of Africans who are arriving here were illiterate entirely. They couldn't, um, they couldn't read or understand a contract and couldn't sign their name, and, and the British weren't going to offer them anyway. So they don't exist. Now, what I'm making here is a, a very sharp distinction between treatment and status. So I think it's very fair to say that many of the Africans who arrived here were treated differently than Africans would be treated some hundred years later. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, in fact, the first Africans were arriving into a sea of other indentured servants and a small number of, of propertied um, elites, if you will, the gentry class. Um, and they were all struggling just to survive in these very early years. They barely were hanging on. And so anyone who proved their mettle, who could, who could help clear the land, who could farm the land, who could make their way, was a valuable member of society. It really didn't matter who they were. Um, so what this tended to do was leaven these sort of status differences. But I still maintain that there was a fundamental status difference um, between Africans and indentured servants, and that Africans were always thought of as slaves. And my primary evidence for this is, A, the lack of sort of contracts for indenture, and B, this much larger Atlantic context in which there were hundreds of thousands of Africans that were brought to, the, brought to various you know, um, countries and cities of the Atlantic world, and in which the British themselves were complicit. That Remember, they were, they were taking, you may ask the question, what were, they, what were they planning to do? And they had been doing this since the 16th century, pirating these slave ships and selling them all over the Americas. Some of these pirates themselves were at Jamestown, uh, so they understood slavery. They knew slavery. So I'm, I should have gone here first. Um, the other thing is that um, the, the, it, it's also telling, I think, that in that first document, the, the 20 and odd Negroes who are sold, that they are named as Negroes. By this time, um, the term Negro has, has been adopted into, uh, it's interesting, in almost every European language it's adopted. Uh, and it's adopted despite the fact that there are other words to describe blackness. I mean, it, you know, think of it in English. We use the term black to describe people's color. Um, the term Negro has a particular resonance which relates directly to slavery. The, the Portuguese and the Spanish were using this term um, as synonymous with slave, and they had another term to describe color. So Negro itself is actually synonymous with slave, and the fact that the English adopt it and use it in this earliest period, again, I think is another scrap of evidence at least, um, that those earliest Africans were conceived as slaves. Now there's other evidence, sort of statu statutory evidence, that I think also speaks in this direction. Um, the 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 1624 Virginia census, there are 22 Africans in that census. Not a single one of these folks is listed with a surname. Uh, nearly half of them were listed with no first name, but rather just say Negro man or Negro woman. And this, for me, raises the question of why these people would be so clearly distinguished in the census if their social status was not somehow different from that of landholders and other indentured servants, um, who in every instance receive you know, a first name and a surname. Uh, why are these people just just Negro man, Negro woman? Um, again, if you think, if you understand that the term Negro is synonymous with slave, then I think you begin to, to get a, a, a sort of broader sense of, of the intellectual world in which uh, many of these folks were living. Now, 
1639, there was a Maryland statute, which I, which I read to, to essentially mean that there were slaves already. I mean, they, they actually write slavery into the statute, uh, even though they're not defining what that slavery is. They say, all inhabitants of the province, being Christians, slaves accepted, shall have and enjoy all such rights, liberties, immunities, privileges, and free customs within this province as any natural-born subject of England. So my question about this is, who are these slaves, and why are they accepted if Africans were indentured servants? Um, so th 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 my point here is, is um, that, you know, just because there isn't a law that says – that defines slavery strictly for us, I don't think that means that, pe that, that Africans were treated outside of uh, – were treated in any other way other than as slaves. Um, the fact that many of them became freed, I mean, look, it's absolutely true that about – in these earliest years, in the first century of slavery in, in the United States, about one in seven Africans eventually gains their freedom. That's a, that's a significant number, 14 percent. Um, but I think the the, the um, explanation for that re re resides much more so in in the sort of evolution of a very difficult frontier society in which the value of, of people's labor is calculated very differently than once that society is completely settled and those in power are able to capitalize um, by virtue of wide, you know, widespread in this case, tobacco production um, on the backs of African laborers who are depersonalized and and very quickly, I would say, um, 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 according to the le toward, to legal statute, made into chattel. Um, and um, this is codified, you know, at least by 1705. Although I think you can argue that even the 1639 statute starts speaking to that. So. What does all of this mean in terms of the African side of the equation? I've already mentioned some of these these figures to you guys, and uh, I, I think you guys will have access to this after the seminar is over. So, um, if you if you want further explanation on any of this stuff, just let me know. But um, the importance of Angola, I think, is also oftentimes left out of the equation. We see the 20 and odd who arrive from Angola, and then um, the story sort of proceeds from there. Oftentimes, along the lines of of what happens economically. In other words, it becomes an economic story about the survival of the Virginia colony and, and the sort of extraordinary story of, 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 of that um, evolution. But in the context of Atlantic, Atlantic slave trade, those 20 and odd Africans were part of a, a large wave of Africans. More than four out of five Africans arriving in the Americas in the first decades of the 17th century hailed from Angola. African immigrants altogether outnumbered European immigrants by a similar rate of four to one. So you can do the math yourself. The majority of immigrants to the Americas generally during this time were Angolans. That just never makes it into the conversation. So what does that mean, particularly in places where the majority of these Angolans were arriving? And here I'm thinking of a place like Brazil where, um, where in the 17th century you have 500,000 Angolans arrive into Brazil. This is an image from, from Brazil, from the northeast of Brazil, a place called Pernambuco in 1630. And what it is is a, is a, is a very explicit um, um, <clears throat> possession ritual, uh, spirit possession ritual, which was used for healing and divination. And um, what you see are a range of people who are entering trance states. Uh, this particular woman here, uh, this man here, they take on the roles of their deceased ancestors, and they do so through, through dancing in a counterclockwise motion, through music, uh, drumming. Um, this scraper, which is known as a heko heko, uh, different size, sizes of drums, one a larger one, one is a smaller one. Um, and then you also see this other gentleman on the side here drinking something, which is probably a beverage known as aluwa. All of these things come from the Kimbundu language. They were all said to be um, speaking in the language of Angola and so on. So these are, these are very distinctly Angolan rituals. I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm already past time, I know. Um, but the question I ask here, which I think is really pertinent for us, is this question about would the Angolans in Virginia have been able to recreate Kalundu in the same way? Why or why not? And I think the answer to that should be fairly obvious. The so-called 20 and odd, um, some of them died off fairly quickly. Others of them did survive quite, quite nicely. But the point is they were atomized. They were, you know, very um, isolated in ways. And they would never have been able to reproduce this, at least not in that, those very earliest years. Um, so this... Having said that, though, those 147 or so who made it to Veracruz very well may have been able to recreate these things. So it, it begs the question of sort of what was in the mind's eye of those 20 and odd who arrive in this, this backwater of Jamestown, um, and what did they imagine that they missed as a result of having been taken away by these privateers?
this very last section, I mean, I, I said if there was enough time, I would cover this. This is the, this is the last article I had you guys read about, um, which related to John Punch and um, his relationship, his particular relationship, um, according to DNA evidence, to President Obama. Um, the first question I ask here is what kinds of historical conclusions can we draw from the assertion that John Punch was from Cameroon? Now, um, if you guys will recall, the article um, basically was, was pointing to Punch. Punch was one of these 17th century figures who had gained his freedom um, and, and had, had, had done fairly well. And the article uh, that you guys read said that he was probably an indentured servant, um, that the DNA evidence said that he, he probably came from Cameroon. And then you read another article which tried to rebut some of this evidence, um, an article by John Thornton and Linda Haywood. Thornton being one of the authors of the earlier article you read on slavery in Africa. Um, it's interesting because John and Linda, John Thornton and Linda Haywood actually argued that um, Punch was very, very likely from Angola, and indeed all of the evidence we have points toward Angola as the as the likely um, as the likely destination from which most of the earliest Africans in, Jam in Jamestown and the Chesapeake came. So it's it's highly unlikely there was no slave trade operating to the Americas from Cameroon during this time. So it raises questions about this DNA. There's a, there's a surge in DNA evidence, as many of you probably know. There are lots of television shows about tracing your African past through DNA. Um, and I'll have you, I, I'll just sort of as a parting word, let you know that we, we had a really interesting seminar here at the University of Wisconsin about a year ago, in which one of my colleagues who, um, his name is uh, Tejumola Olanian. He's, he's very clearly um, Yoruba. He's of Yoruba ancestry, he comes from Nigeria. He took this, one of these DNA tests, and the DNA test came back and said, just like John Punch, that he was from Cameroon. Um, so he was startled. My, my, my colleague was startled to learn that he was from Cameroon or that his, his ancestors were from Cameroon. But what, what all of this goes to show is that, that um, DNA evidence only points to one ancestor in the past, in the very deep, deep past, out of the many, many, many thousands of ancestors that we might have had. And it doesn't account for the movement of people. So my colleague's, um, um, you know, relative who is now showing up as a DNA swat swatch in Cameroon may have migrated there from Nigeria, who knows when, or his family may have, um, and that's why you get this positive match to Cameroon. So I would, I would urge you to be skeptical about the scientific evidence because it oftentimes leaves out history, and history is crucially important here. I would say the same thing about John Punch. All of the documentary evidence and all of the slave trade evidence we have points to the fact that the earliest Africans in the Chesapeake were from Angola. John Thornton and Linda Haywood spell this out in the article that, they, that, they, um, that I provided for you guys. So the, the question then is, does, this, does any of this have any bearing whatsoever on President Obama, uh, or should they? Um, that's a question that I will leave for you guys. I mean, I think it's it's the one that you can you can um, bat around with your students. I think they would they would really really enjoy um, thinking about the implications of of slavery and the slave trade, DNA evidence um, in the present of a president who is assumed to have roots in East Africa in Kenya, but not necessarily tied to the slave trade, let alone through his white mother. <laughs> Uh, as I was, I was saying, the, uh, <clears throat> that the, uh, the contemporary uh, stuff there about President Obama may be a good way for teachers to hang this lesson on a contemporary piece of news. I know often they like to do that. They like to start with the present and work backwards. <clears throat> so there may be a good hook for you. We've come to the end of our seminar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me ask if we have any more questions. Uh, I'll be looking at the... Um, chat here. I don't see any more coming through, so let me tell you to please continue using the form to continue the discussion. Please check it out because we're going to be putting some bi bi bibliographical material on the form for you that will help you flesh out this seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for your intelligent and enthusiastic participation. And Jim, I want to thank you too. Let me turn the mic back on to you so that you can uh, respond. There you go, Jim. Thank you very much for another excellent seminar. Jim, thank you very much for another excellent seminar. My pleasure. I had a great time. Thank you all so much. And all of you, feel free. I mean, bombard me with emails. I'm happy to answer your questions. You can find me online fairly easily. So I'm, I'm at your service. Feel free to get in touch with me. <laughs> and you can indeed pass your questions along to Jim through the uh, form. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your participation. Please check our schedule. We've got a lot of other really interesting seminars coming up. Um, the way you escape the classroom is to go up to your upper left-hand corner. You'll see the word file. Click on that, and there'll be a drop-down menu that says something like exit session. 
Do that, and you're home free. Thanks once again, and have a good evening. Jim, I thought that went well. I hope you enjoyed it. That was fun. Yeah, that was a good seminar. Yeah, thank you very much. I felt like I'd talked too much and didn't get – get, I, I was actually worried I wasn't going to be able to fill the time. <laughs> that was well, of me. We, we had good discussion, and uh, <clears throat> we were able to fill the time quite well. If we do this again, or I should say when we do this again, maybe we should uh, – Cut the uh, <clears throat> stuff about Brazil and the Obama connection, and end just with uh, Jamestown. Yeah, but it went very, yeah. very well. Yeah. yeah, I think you're probably right. Some of that's superfluous, I, and it looked like a, a good crowd eventually showed up. Yeah, too. yeah, we had uh, about 50 people, which wow. is a very good enrollment for us. That's, that's good. That's I'm, really I'm good. pleased. Yeah, good yeah. number. Okay, well, I'll let you go. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I guarantee you we'll be back to uh, ask you to do some more seminars. It went very that well. Sounds, that sounds great. Thanks for soldiering through, too. I know you weren't feeling too well, but you did a great job. <laughs> well, I'm, actually, I feel fine. It's just that my voice is disappearing, so yeah, I'm yeah. going to go home. And I think the best restorative is a glass of wine, so that's what I'm going to do tonight. I, I'm with you on that one. I'm right behind you. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, take care. Right. Take care, Richard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>